Welcome back to another episode of the Dynasty Digest, where we give you a consumable dynasty perspective. I'm Jake, joined as always by Tim. Guys, we are super, super close to 2,500 subscribers, so help us with that journey there. Today, Tim and I are going to compare our ranks a little bit and discuss a few of the players that we have the biggest gap on, but help us with that journey. And here's your 10 seconds to go click that subscribe button. Welcome. You're listening to JWB Fantasy Football. Thanks for listening. All right, Tim, as you know, we went through, looked at our rankings and decided the players that we were most different on outside of the caveat of Tim didn't want to have to badmouth Rasheed Rice in public again. So we just skipped him, but we're going to start off with the quarterback position. Uh, this is the only position we're going to talk about two players on because in Superflex, it's the most valuable position. Um, so those two quarterbacks are Baker Mayfield and Will Levis. So I personally have Baker at 19 in my rankings. I have Will Levis at 25. And Tim is actually basically completely flipped on that, except he is uh, Levis at 20. So just a little bit less uh, than I have Baker. And then he's got Baker at 25. So we, the bottom end of our spectrum and top end of our spectrum are pretty similar here, but give me your reasons, uh, like compare those two briefly for me and, and give me kind of your reasons why you haven't flipped. When it comes to my dynasty ranks, I think it's important to understand that I feel that really understanding what the market price is or what you could get for this guy what you'd have to pay for this guy. I think it matters. So I, I do believe that Baker's worthwhile as a starting quarterback, but I do think there are some, some scenarios in which he doesn't reach those same heights. Just for example, um, he did play well in the playoffs, 27 and 25 points. So he was definitely a catalyst in that offense to try to, you know, propel them to victories, even though they didn't win the second one, but he had six games under 12 points um, last year. And he also had, uh, seven games where he, he had less or uh, one touchdown or less. And then another six games where he was under 200 yards, 200 yards or less, I should say. So there is an opportunity for him to have a low ceiling week. Now he was pretty consistent when it came to like comparing him to a lot of other quarterbacks, like but also, <laughs> yes, but also we are looking at him through the lens of QB 10 where he played a full season. And there were a lot of quarterbacks that didn't make that. So if we look at just even adding in, you know, a Kirk cousins, he's most likely behind him as well as other quarterbacks as well. I'm not trying to list them all off. Cause I can't remember exactly which ones all missed, but I think that QB 10 is a misrepresentation of his actual production, but I do think he's a worthwhile super flex quarterback, but in terms of dynasty value, I just can't get there. And see, I can get there with what I've seen out of Baker. I, I mean, I think we can all agree and the numbers back it up. Um, you know, 2023 was the best fantasy season he's ever had in terms of finish in fantasy points per game. Technically, his rookie year was higher points per game, but he finished one spot lower. Um, but when it comes to this range of quarterbacks with me with that quarterback, like 18 to 25 range that we're kind of talking about here, insulated value is really kind of what makes or breaks you know some of these you know positional battles for me and i think that you know if baker's floor completely falls out and he goes back to being like you know a 16 uh 15 and a half to 16 points per game like he was in his sophomore and junior year in the nfl essentially i still think he maintains enough value there and yes he's never going to be a world beater he's never going to you know break into the top 12 quarterbacks uh, for fantasy, uh, especially in dynasty rankings. But when I'm looking at the the guys that I have just behind him, um, Justin Fields, which is, you know, that one's hard for me to do, but it, it's objective. Like Justin Fields is a backup quarterback right now. Um, 20, it's the highest on our team. Um, but I, I still think it's a fair ranking for him. Uh, 21 is Stafford really just taking age into consideration there. You can be considerably younger with Baker and the fantasy production last year. Wasn't too different. Um, I've got Gino right there. Again, age um, is really the biggest factor there. Rogers again, age like, so a lot of these guys in this range are older. Um, and then you, you obviously get to Will Levis there. Um, but the, the big distinguishing factor between Baker and Levis for me is We've seen bad Baker and bad Baker is still like you can put him in your lineup and not feel 
awful about it. But Will Levis is a guy that I absolutely hated coming into the into the draft, um, his rookie year, or uh, his his draft class. Thought he was overhyped by a lot of people. Him being invited to the draft only to follow the second round was a, a little tough to see, but was expected by me. I had a second or third round grade on him, you know, a day two pick. But for me, I just see a guy who's not an NFL quarterback. Like the arm is there, but he struggles under pressure. He throws a lot of bad balls that should be that could be intercepted or are intercepted. And if you want to talk about like the despair, like the disparity between their best and worst performances, like obviously Baker gets a little bit more slack on some of that just because he's been in the league longer. But like Will Levis had a negative point game last year. It negative 1.4 in a game. His ceiling was only uh was 26.6 points. His his first start. No film on him from college. I, I'm not surprised that that game went as well as it did for him. But then immediately after that, <coughs> he had more passing yards the next week, but didn't throw a touchdown, had a pick. Followed that up with a 48% completion percentage against Tampa Bay, no touchdowns with an interception. He followed that up with two touchdowns, jump back up but that was the last multi-touchdown game that he had all year and i know that the team has improved this year um you know wide receiver wise adding in calvin ridley obviously gives him another weapon i think they've made some investments in the offensive line as well derrick henry gone with two running backs who are more competent pass catchers than henry's ever been so like the, the improvements are you making my case for me jake i'm getting there so I understand the argument for the improvement being there. The problem is, is I still just don't think he's cut out to be an NFL quarterback. Like I think I'm, be, I'm thinking best possible outcome having him at 25, because to me he's just in he's like a a strong armed backup. Like that's he's got a good arm. Nobody's gonna argue that, but. He's not accurate. He had the 34. He was 34th in accuracy rating per player profiler last year. He was 32nd in PFF passing grade. So dead last among starting quarterbacks in the NFL. His true passer rating last year was 33rd. His quarterback rating was 28th. His red zone accuracy was 39th. His catchable pass rate was 35th. Like he throws a good deep ball. That's really the only like positive of his game. And for me, you know, him, he's going to be 25 this year. So even as just a second year player, he's already old compared to other players in the league. And I, it's just a lot harder for me to see him taking an ascension to the next level. Whereas I think Baker at 19 can maintain that value for a couple of years, which is really where the discrepancy comes for me. Now, I want to make this clear. I do not dislike Baker. I'm talking more or less value wise i, I just want to like read off of this a little I'm bit of my put that out there i just want to read off a little bit of my list though so when we get to levis levis at 20 i have bryce young behind him yes i do bryce too young low, behind him but we just talked about him not that long ago so i'm not gonna bring it up too much but i feel i feel that's too low on bryce then i have fields aaron Rodgers, stafford baker Derek carr daniel jones howell garner Minshew. How many of these guys that I just listed do, would you straight up trade Will Levis for? All right, let's go about, go one by one again. It'll be easier for Young. me. So Bryce, easy. Smash. Justin Fields. Smash. Aaron Rodgers. Smash. Matthew Stafford. Smash. Baker. Smash. Derek Carr. I would accept it, but I'd have to think about it. Daniel Jones. I would, I'd probably... I'd rather have Jones just because of the rushing. Sam Howell. I don't care. Garner Minshew. Probably Levis. Okay. So you're smashing all the aging veterans, which totally fine with. But I don't think you have to throw Levis in to go get those guys. I think you can pay late seconds, some late seconds and something on top. I think you can go get those guys regardless and keep the opportunity for the value explosion that could be Will Levis in his second season. I drafted a lot of little Will Levis in the second round. I also was a guy that's not, I'm not, a, I'm not a Levis guy. Like I'm not like, Oh, he's a great right. quarterback, but I'm looking at it from the terms of I'm not, I didn't one that my, my draft, my draft last year does not impact my ranks, but right. I'm explaining my thought process. 
I didn't have to um, invest serious capital into these guys or into this player multiple times. I did it a lot in the second round. So uh, the, the, the risk reward is all on my side. When it comes to the aging quarterbacks, once again, I can go get those guys for cheap. I would rather be trading straight up really old aging quarterbacks in a lot of scenarios for Will Levis for that chance that he explodes. And then I can sell him if I want to. But my my feeling is, one, it's not a Derrick Henry dominated team anymore. They're going to throw the ball. I understand Will Levis is a deep ball, mer- deep ball merchant. I know that he's not like overly talented when it comes to being accurate with the football. I totally get that. But the, the offense is geared to dumping off the ball to the running backs, not handing off as much. They improved the receiving core. They're, I, I'm, I hate doing number projections right now, but I believe they'll pass the ball more in terms of volume. Uh, I just if I hate Mike that. Vrabel's not your head coach, you're going to throw the ball more. There, there's just there's just so much where like everyone's like, oh, is this is going to happen? I'm like, no, let's not romanticize every situation. But for me, the the idea is that I I, I would expect more consistent yardage games if he is playing well. Now, he might play terribly, right? Boom. Okay, he sucks. What, what do we give up for him, Derek Carr? Cool. <laughs> like, there's, like, the investment for me is so is so minuscule for what, what the opportunity for uh, a value increase or a production increase looks like because the league is, is suffering for quarterbacks right now, right? So if, if you even get a competent Will, Will Levis, like, not even, I'm not saying, like, even average, just, like, give me a top 20 quarterback, right? The Titans most likely are not in a position to be drafting a quarterback high then. They're probably going to be, at worst, pick 10. So he might even have another opportunity to be safe for another season, too. And if he starts off hot, I can probably flip him for a lot more than than what Derek Carr offers on the market. So I just think there's a lot of opportunity, dynasty, value-wise, to take Will Levis. Because I'm not going to argue with stats. His stats are garbage. Yeah. They're, they're garbage. But... With the excitement of of adding more players, with the excitement of what is this offense going to look like? And if he starts out hot, I might have found myself a great QB2 for the season. Or I found myself a really great trade chip that Derek Carr had those. He had those uh, those waves of really great production where he was around QB12 or even higher for six to eight weeks in the season. He wasn't worth anything in trade. He just wasn't. And I think even if you have guys that are completely out or owners that are completely out on Will Levis, you're going to have some that are, are still in or are hungry for a young quarterback that obviously he's going to be 25. I understand he's not young, young, but like compared to either you have the studs or you're looking for aging vets, he gives you a nice in between in, in the market to go and diversify that asset. If you feel later in the season or early in the season, whenever you feel the value jump is to go take care of that. While I I, rec- I recognize the sentiment behind the point, I just I really struggle to see that jump be possible with Will Levis. So that that's where like you know I kind of essentially like my flag plant there is worst possible scenario for Will Levis is truly non-existent value, whereas like if Baker is quarterback eighteen. 1920 in week 10 and I'm a non-competitive team like I can still at least get a second out of Levitt or out of Baker whereas if Levis is quarterback 28 29 30 I, I don't know if I can get a second round pick for Will Levis at that point knowing that second round pick so he doesn't have you know the contract stability of the the first round quarterbacks he is on a team that otherwise is set up to compete. Maybe, you know, they make a move. If, if by like Will's week six, Will Levis isn't cutting it, it wouldn't shock me to see them go after like a Joe Flacco type player, off uh, bring Ryan Tannehill back in. Like who knows what it's going to be. But it, it, it just feels like his chances of getting replaced midseason are a lot higher to me than Baker just falling off the face of the earth, which is really what it boils down to. And sure, I've got some aging guys in front of him. I recognize the risk in that, but to, to a point, like I'd rather take the risk on a guy who I know can have a really good season. And I just don't know that Will Levis can be anything more than like a quarterback 22. 
That's fair. I'll say this too. It might be the time, like, or, or like, um, it might be now or in uh, a recent time that you might be able to move or move or want to move Levis, like, because he may end up being worth close to a first or more than a first when the draft comes around and a team misses out on the quarterbacks and they want to navigate around the board a little bit. So it could be that opportunity comes even sooner than you think. But I think there's going to be a market for this guy, especially if if they don't start off like complete dog shit. And I can agree with that. There there can be a market there. I just I view that as a lower percentile outcome. Really what it boils down mm-hmm. to for me. Whereas I, I feel Baker is the safer asset and production wise, like I don't really know if Will Levis's ceiling, just based off of his limitations as a player, is that different than Baker's. And I'll say this, I think um I think Baker gets a really bad rap. Um I, Dynasty Coach Aid and I talk about this because I actually like Baker, but um, he played injured in Cleveland and lost his job because of it. Like if he, if he honestly, when he, when he gets injured, like earlier in the season, what was it like we, I forget exactly. I think it was like towards the middle, like week yeah. seven, eight, something like that. If he just shuts it down, right. He's got the starting job next year. Yep. It's crazy. And we don't have the fun that is Baker Mayfield throwing to Mike Evans. <laughs> we love it. All right. That's enough on the quarterbacks. Let's move it over to the running back position. So the running back that we are most different on, uh, or at least, you know, one of the running backs that we are the most different on, it actually might be, you know, in terms of relevant running backs, I should say, um, Ramondre Stevenson. I am the high guy on JWB. I still think Ramondre is an RB1. You do not. I got him at 12. You got him at 28. I'm going to make my argument first on this one of why I have Ramondre so high. And it should really surprise absolutely nobody. Um, Dude catches passes. Really what it boils down to, New England's not in a position to add a running back to their team. Uh, Picking at three um, and this class really, you know, the the running backs, they could draft some guys who could complement him very well um i I do recognize that as a possibility um but ramondre is is a high volume receiver he's gotten in 2022 he had 87 targets last year even missing some time um you know he missed uh from week he i believe he left the game in week 13 and then uh missed the rest of the season so injuries definitely factoring into the overall numbers there but he had 48 targets last year through 13 weeks um 38 receptions didn't have a receiving touchdown believe it or not um he only had one receiving touchdown in 2022 again both years bad offenses touchdown totals not being you know not too surprising there but i think you know when it comes down to Ramondre, I, it's kind of like best of a bad situation like he gets a lot of targets because there's not a lot of pass catchers there I, I don't imagine them adding a pass catcher at three. I imagine they're going quarterback, especially if this JJ McCarthy at two hype is real and they can get Drake may at three. Awesome. Good for them. Um, but you know, I see a very solid runner. I Jayden see Daniels. Anyone? No, thank you. Um, <laughs> what? I would take Drake may over Jaden Daniels. I, I don't cut the show off. We're done. We've already talked about this, Tim. We did a whole episode on our rookies, <laughs> or at least our top 12 rookies at the time, which mine has since changed. Fun fact. So keep an eye out for those rookie rankings when we drop them. But, you know, I just view Ramondre as the best player on a bad team. And I still think, you know, he can put up running back one production. I know people were a little disappointed last year. Um, his, his points per game wasn't great. 12.1, uh, which was running back 27. Um, but we are talking about a guy who the year prior uh, was running back 10. Ramondre started the season strong. He had a running back two week uh, this past year, um, running back six week, running back seven weeks. So the dude still had, you know, very, very solid weeks uh, of production there. And with the running back landscape, you know, I am giving a little bit of benefit of the doubt of him only being 26 compared to a lot of other guys. Um, guys that are that I have behind him that I think you can make a legitimate argument for me having in front of him. Kenneth Walker. I just don't like Kenneth Walker. 
He's a guy that like I, I'm just not inspired looking at him in my lineup. Um, I've James Cook at 14, Swift at 15, Henry at 16. It's really what it boils down to is just like the guys behind him are just older. So it's kind of the same argument I had with Baker. Like the other guys in the range are older, so I prefer the youth a little bit. But if we're being honest, running back after like running back 10, it's kind of just like maybe just like keep tearing down as many times as you can to like from running back 10 to running back like 21 and just as crew accrue as much value as you can get in that range. Like each time you tear back a little bit and just have like four second round picks and <laughs> go wild, go wild draft all the running backs in this class. <laughs> I don't hate Ramondre. I understand that we've seen better days from him, but I want to read off a little bit, a little, a little something, something for you. So he had all those targets, all those receptions, yards per catch, week by week. Week one, he had ten point eight. Then he had three point three, three, five, zero on two targets, four point three, eight point five, five point five. 10.5, 4.6, and 1.8. This man gets you yardage after he receives those passes. So, yeah. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> he does, though. Like, his average depth of target last year was negative, kind of to be expected. But he his total his total yak in, in uh, yards after the catch in 2023 was 7.2 yards after the catch per reception. Sir, which was exactly the same as his receiving efficiency in 2022, and his yards per out run was still right around one. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it even closer. So, in a full PPR setting, his his receiving points per game: uh, 12.4, four, 1.3, three, zero, 7.4, 11.1, 3.1. 8.2, 4.4, 5.9. I'm not, I don't know how that gets to the top 12. So I, I, once again, if he's your RB three on your team, cool. You can throw him in. You probably get yourself 12 points and you're happy, but I don't know how you get to RB 12. Like there's so many more upside, better upside players, players in better offenses, players that um, are in better offenses as well as don't, potentially like I'm not, I don't think they had a running back like you said but like what what does this offense really give you and with it, like being a complete facelift there's no guarantee he keeps you know a, a full-time job in this offense either so it could be a really crappy offense where he's sharing the backfield with with Gibson so who else receives passes I just I don't see the I don't see the ceiling that's my problem I, I think that he can give you a decent floor because of the fact that he'll get volume, but I, I just, it doesn't seem like a guy that's going to go win me leagues. And I agree with that. Like I said, I think my ranking of him is at 12 really just has more to do. Like I don't love Ramondre Stevenson. It's more just that running back is kind of a hellscape where you have to kind of find the weekly ceiling to me rather than the consistency. I just value that a little bit more. And I think with his receiving, that offense was atrocious. Mac Jones was bad. Bailey Zappi was bad. Did anybody else throw a pass for them last year? I don't really remember. Mm. Even if they did, they were bad. Like there was no good quarterback play there. But I think his skill set can benefit a rookie quarterback. And I think he can be the consistent option on that team. Because as we know, their their receivers could not separate. Just absolutely couldn't do it. Their new receivers that they've signed and gotten, KJ Osborne, can't separate. Like they're just kind of recycling the same type of players, in my opinion. And I just I see him being a high volume option rather than being a guy who just isn't. And yes, Gibson could, you know, cut into his production a little bit, but again, running back sucks right now. And like there's no reason to overvalue some of the older guys because the market simply doesn't. Like, I'd rather have James Conner on my team than Ramondre Stevenson, but I don't have to rank him that way. 
the market doesn't rank them that way. Like the market feels very, very different from me. Who else is, you know, kind of in that range? Like I prefer like, I, okay, this is a guy I know you don't like Ramondre or Pacheco. Oh, it's Pacheco. And don't say I don't like Pacheco. I just don't like Pacheco's ceiling. But Ramondre's got the ceiling. Pacheco's got the offense. <laughs> Valid. I, I think the offense does improve, and I do think it opens up more touchdown opportunities for New England. And I think as it sits right now, Ramondre's probably going to get the goal line carries. Is you and I, still around? You, I don't you know. and I can both agree, though, that this this New England offense doesn't get better until they have wide receivers that can get open. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Just it is what it, it is. I don't know how you make a room that bad. Like three oh, of their wide receivers. Bill Belichick is in like, charge of your, your player personnel. We're like bottom 10% in separation. It was crazy. Yeah. They were awful. Speaking of wide receivers, transition over to one of our bigger differences amongst relevant wide receivers. Um, and that's Devonta Smith. You have him at 10. I have him at 18. Let's hear your argument for him at 10. And I'll give you mine for him at 18. Well, he was what wide receiver 10 the year prior. And we really didn't see that big of a difference besides the consistent target share that he got the year prior. And that really had to do a lot more with early season than it did late season because late season, his, his targets really did start to come back where he hit eight plus targets um, of the majority of games. And we looked at, I want to say six games where AJ Brown was like 12 or more targets. So I just, I don't, I don't think it's consistent. It's going to be consistent the same way next season. I think it's going to be more that um, Devonte Smith is someone that's going to be getting uh, a more consistent target share. I think there are some fixes that had to, ha- had to ha- that had to occur because defenses were not even biting on their play action. And by bringing in the Saquon, things like that, you're going to get more single dub coverage. You're going to get more opportunities for deep plays that make weeks just even on one play. And then you have the remaining um, remainder of the game to just continue to pile on. So I do believe that he is as close to a wide receiver one as possible. He's just not in that top group where you have your true difference makers that we talk about all the time. But like, I just think there's, um, I think there's a pretty big chasm from like the, the big time wide receivers to that next level. And so I always, I should say, I shouldn't say always, but I'm, I'm big on moving the ones that are, are kind of, uh, I don't say roster clogger, but up as much as you can. And I think that Devante Smith is one of those targets right now, especially because I think he is pretty disrespected this off season by the market that you could pretty much move some pretenders for him. And, I think you're going to be pretty happy week to week with what you get. And then he gives you a pretty astronomical ceiling. So for me, um, he was what was wide receiver 19 last year with a pretty down season passing by the Eagles in a lot of scenarios. If we really look at it, like most weren't, weren't happy with the Jalen Hurts mm-hmm. production. Most weren't, weren't happy with once again, like I focus on this so much because it matters how ineffective the play action game was with, with their, with their team. And a guy like Saquon, I think, only helps that. Yeah. As well as he only draws more defenders to the flat. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to one on one someone because you're probably gonna keep a safety over AJ Brown, which means more parts of the field are gonna be open for those guys that can navigate those areas and create space quickly. And Devontae Smith is one of those people. Yeah. I I don't dislike, you know, we're, we're kind of talking about the same thing with every player in the sense that like, I don't dislike Devonta Smith and like me having him at 18 isn't really a slight to him. It's just for me, it's more of a rationalization of the wide receiver market and what I think he can produce um, given his situation. So for me, um, obviously never going to be the wide receiver one on his own team with AJ Brown being there, just never going to happen. He's always going to be, he's always going to be playing second fiddle, but really if we're looking at like the receivers that I have directly in front of him, I know there's two guys on this list that you'll make a strong argument for being again behind him in Rishi Rice and Nico Collins. I mean, I don't hate Nico, but I think we probably have seen some of the best games Nico's going to have. 
just very they, possible. Especially games with with Rashid or not Rashid, um, with Tank out. So, but so we we've, we've got R- Rashid and we've got Nico. Um, also right in front of him, um, I have Jalen Waddle, who I just think is. You know, he's also the wide receiver too on his own team, but he's in a position, just his usage and the the style that they use him in is a little bit more effective for fantasy purposes um, in terms of overall volume and touchdown potential. I just think it's a little bit better there because Devonta Smith's touchdowns are typically big touchdowns. Like the dude has seven red zone targets the entire season, 14% target share in the red zone. Like he, he's just not used there. Whereas Waddle is definitely used there. Um, I have Stefan Diggs in front of him again wide receiver one better quarterback he's older sure i think the drop off quote unquote that we saw out of him last year was heavily exaggerated and if we're gonna like call stefan Diggs season last year a down year which yeah the second half wasn't that great but i mean we're talking about still a, a very very good fantasy season and i still think he's got multiple seasons in him we've got drake london ahead of him dj moore brandon Ayuk, michael Pittman, like just all more consistent volume earners it's really like i just struggle to see smith make an ascension there and with wide receivers one of the positions where i i tend to fluctuate more um uh, opposed to our team consensus rankings just because i i value volume a little bit more I should say a lot more than some of the guys on our teams. And while I recognize that Smith does have the potential to get volume, he's always going to be playing second fiddle on his team. And so for me, I can't consciously rank him as a wide receiver one when he's a wide receiver one, not the wide receiver one on his own team. And I just don't think Jalen Hurts is ever going to throw that much to make it happen, which is really like, that's my only knock on Devonta Smith over like, realistically it's just there's a lot of really good wide receivers and his team isn't going to throw to the volume that other teams are so like while devonta smith may have some really solid weeks even last year like his ceiling in terms of like weekly finish wide receiver four was as high as he got which is a good finish don't get me wrong but even that was like 23.6 points like it's hard for me to call that like a week winning week when we saw like 50 point weeks out of DJ Moore and Jamar chase, like, so like the ceiling is good. The floor is still solid, but it's just, I can't rank that as a wide receiver one, which is really where, you know, his ranking comes to me. I, everybody, pretty much everybody on JWB has him in like the 10 to 13 range, except for me. So I'm, I'm the low you guy. Suck. I do. <laughs> I'm the low guy. I'm fine being the low guy there. I just, I see too much upside with a lot of wide receivers. And I mean, let's be honest, like wide receiver, we we say it every year. It's just getting deeper and deeper. There's so many talented wide receivers, even this year, you know, three legitimate guy, three guys who would probably legitimately be wide receiver one in a lot of draft classes coming in all at the same time. Uh, One of the deepest wide receiver classes we've ever seen. Like I've, legit like 14 prospects that i think can be legitimate fantasy producers what like wide receiver three years or better like kind of in that flex range of player and smith is really good he's young he's got a lot going for him he's just not in the best situation to to take advantage of those talents and there is i i can't believe i'm saying this but there are times where situation does become a little bit more important than talent and I think this is one of those situations where the situation just drags him down a little bit for me. I just want to say last year he had six games of 17 plus points. So basically a third of his of his games here. You're looking at really good scoring weeks. But I yeah. get it. I hear what you're saying. I because mean, he, we he was it, solid. And, uh, like he was a good wide receiver last year, but I I just I don't see him being like to me, 18 gives me wiggle room. That's kind of how I view that too. Like, if he if he finishes a little below that, I'm not that upset because of where I have him ranked. And if he finishes above that, I feel like it's just a win. Whereas like wide receiver ten, like it's hard to like if he's if I rank him at wide receiver ten and he finishes at eighteen, I feel worse than if I rank him at eighteen and he finishes at twenty. Which is like I don't imagine him really finishing worse than like wide receiver twenty in points per game, which is what he was last year. So that's just kind of how I view things there. Like I'd rather be 
I'd rather be too low on a wide receiver than too high on one. That's fair. Except for Michael Pittman. I'll always be too high on Michael Pittman. Michael Who's Pittman. your wide receiver? 10. Wide receiver 10. <laughs> so I'll say this. I uh, When Skyler and I do our sit starts, I think it's very important to try to identify, you know, around seven targets per game. I think that's a really nice number to try to identify who um, who's going to be the who's going to be our, our hot starts for those weeks when it comes to wide receiver. So I agree with you. I think targets definitely do matter. I I on this I want to also bet on his talent as well, and I just I just think there's so many ways in which this offense can continue to get better. I understand they just lost Kelsey, so it might even change a little bit. But we didn't see that that offense running at like top tier level all season. Like we saw the year before, you know, Brian Johnson was a terrible offensive coordinator who just thought the middle third of the field didn't exist. Like it was, (laughs) it was bad. So I just, I think there's a lot more opportunity for this offense to grow. And I feel like it only gets better with Saquon. I can agree. I like Devonte Smith. I just don't like him that much, but Speaking of a guy that this might be the one where this was the position where we probably had the biggest difference, but I think we feel the same way about the guy (laughs) and anybody who knows who I don't like at the tight end position should already know who we're going to talk about, but I'm going to keep hammering it in because the market and I'll say it JWB as a whole is too high on Dalton Kincaid. I have him at 11. You have him at seven. Like, I, I don't even really know what else there is to talk about about Kincaid at this point. Like, guy didn't earn a ton of targets. He was 14th in target share amongst tight ends. His usage decreased in the red zone, which is typically where we want to see our tight ends succeed the most because touchdowns are super, super important to them. He had 91 targets, 73 receptions, 673 yards, and two touchdowns. Like, for all intents and purposes, he's a fine tight end. I just can't rank a, rank a fine tight end at seven. I can't do it. I'm with you. I have him at seven, but I have him at seven because the market value, but I don't value him as one of those top four to five tight ends that change the game that, you know, you pay extra for. But I do think that playing with Allen should give you a bump. He did have some good double digit point weeks last last year but i do agree with you that you want your tight end being a red zone target you want your tight end being one of those alphas where in certain situations you just know this is the tight end getting the ball not saying not saying there aren't wide receivers you can target i mean though like this is a true legitimate threat we're more or less you're pleasantly surprised when he breaks off a nice play or when he you know gets multiple uh, targets on the same drive things like that so i i think that understanding the market is important when it comes to Dalton Kincaid. He was my tight end one coming out last year. I wasn't going to draft him in the first round. Laporte was such my late third target, and then he couldn't be a late third target anymore. Oh, I was so disappointed. But yeah, so I just, I don't have much of him. Uh, if I did, mm-hmm. I'd be, I'd be definitely shopping him, especially if I can tear down, pick up a, a nice second round pick and another uh, tight end that like Jake Ferguson, but um, I just love like Ferguson. Evan Ingram, exactly. If I can pick up a nice piece, you know, have myself um, basically no loss in production, and then I get an opportunity to shoot the moon again, I'm going to do that. Um, or even use use him to try to trade up. You know, it yeah. could be an opportunity to go, you know, a team that might not be in their contending window anymore. Go get yourself an Andrews, or maybe someone's done with Pitts. Now, I I'm a believer that the Pitts injury did have an impact on his performance and 100%. I, don't know if, I don't know if that's something that's going to continue if it is then i'm i'm out on pits i also have no pits because i wasn't going to draft pits for the first round pick so i just there's there are opportunities when it comes to me and tight ends i just i treat them differently so there there is that threat that pits mm-hmm. is just never rookie pits again but i would rather take that chance with kirk cousins coming in who can definitely make that guy an alpha where I'm not sure Josh Allen wants to do that with his tight ends. So I, I just think there's a lot more risk than what should be at tight end seven, where, yeah, it used to just be basically two tight ends, but we've seen it start to, you know, it's out a little bit, but at this opportunity, yeah, I think he's a, I think he's a sell. I think he's a move. 
yeah, he could come out next year gangbusters based on the fact that there's no Gabe Davis and maybe Curtis Samuel doesn't do what we're expecting him to do. Maybe, but I, I don't really want to bet on maybes when it comes to top seven at the position. Yeah, I, I think with Kincaid, I think the best use of him as an asset is to tear up because he's one of those guys where the market value just doesn't align with the production. I don't think it ever will align with the production, but the the addition needed to get into those legitimate tiers of tight ends, it, it's simply not large enough for me to not do it. Like to go from him to... I'll even use keep trade cut. Like I, I think that's a, a decent um, enough representation of this because I don't actually like, I don't think tight end keep trade cut is too far off of to go from Kincaid to Trey McBride is like a fourth in value to go from Kincaid to Mark Andrews is basically like a push trade. And I don't think you would really struggle to pull that off in a lot of leagues. Like, even if you're adding, like, a third to Kincaid to get Mark Andrews, I'm doing it every time. Or If you like, can, I'm doing that every time. I don't know if that's – if I have Andrews, I'm I'm saying, nah, I'm good. But yeah, there, might be, there might be a team that, you know, that is ready for youth. Maybe they think that um, – I'm going to forget his name right now. Backup tight end in Baltimore is going to continue to to take snaps away from, from Andrews or take targets away. Isaiah Likely. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that the, just the pivots are too good. And with tight end, like I don't want to overinvest. I don't want to stay except for Kyle Pitts. I'm tight end too. fight me. Kirk Cousins is going to bring him to life. Tight end six, baby. But yeah, like I think, you know, th I think there's a clear like kind of top six tight ends. In fantasy. And then from there, it, it's a similar situation where it's like identify the best tight end that you like that people rank below Kincaid and just try and tear down as many times as you can or just put the feelers out there. See what it takes you to jump from Kincaid La to Laporta. See what it takes you to jump from Kincaid to Hawkinson. That's a trade you might be able to pull off straight up and give me Hawkinson a thousand out of 500 times. Like if I could get two Hawkinsons for every one Kincaid that I had, I'd feel great. You know what? Also, if you have a decent room, going cross positionally might be the move. Yeah, you might you might find something that someone that either maybe it's the Allen owner that has a shortfall at tight end or wants the stack and will yeah. you'll be able to charge more, or someone that doesn't have a tight end at all, and they're like, I have access to tight end seven. Yeah, go ahead, buddy. Let me get one of your uh, receivers that are going to score better. Almost yeah. every single. I week. mean, I mean, keep trade cut market value with tight end premium turned on. Kincaid is ahead of Ayuk, Pittman, Waddle, Odunes, Nico. He's kind of right in that range. Devonta Smith, who we just talked about, Jonathan Taylor is kind of right in that range. Kyron, DJ Moore. Let me just list wide receivers until I find one that I wouldn't take over Dalton Kincaid. Um, DJ Moore, Tank Dell, Jordan Addison, T. Higgins, Rasheed Rice, Zay Flowers, DK, JSN. So we got to get to a wide receiver 26 on keep trade cut to get to a wide receiver that I would at least I would think about not taking over Kincaid. I would still probably take him. Um, if we keep going pickings, probably rather have pickings, honestly. He's actually got a quarterback who can throw a deep ball now. I'm excited to see what happens with that offense. By the uh, way. Um, you know, we can quick. keep going too. Jane Reed, Debo, like it just there's so many wide receivers. Oh. I, so many wide receivers I prefer to Kincaid that are ranked behind him based on market value right now. So even if you like Kincaid at tight end seven, you don't have to have tight end seven on your team. Like the 9.2 points per game that he got in non tight end premium last year is replaceable. I, I um there was one, one other player that we had listed that we didn't talk about that I just want to quickly talk. I think um I think Najee, the more and more I look at his his price this offseason is like the most undervalued running back that I would like to take a shot on if I can get him at decent prices. I just bought him in a league. I paid 210 and 307. I might have gotten away with just 210 based on how quickly this uh, other manager accepted my offer. So I might have just wished I tried that, but 
I think you're going to get yourself a mid teen running back pretty easily with running back or top 12 running back um, ceiling week to week, especially if that often scores more points because he didn't score a touchdown until week seven. So I, I think there's more going to be more opportunity for him to, to get you that base six points almost. Um, I don't want to say every week, but uh, most weeks where you can be somewhat confident that you're going to get above above that 10 point mark pretty, pretty easily in the first quarter or something like that. While I respect it, I'm not sure how much of an upgrade Arthur Smith is from Matt Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I like the biggest issue with Najee last year and besides the touchdowns and just that team's lack of scoring was Jalen Warren's usage. And he's getting an offensive coordinator who, when he has not had Derrick Henry, has used rotations at running back. We saw it last year. I mean, we saw, what, three running backs get semi-decent play in Bijan, Algier, and Cordero? Well, and to be fair, I don't even think that, that, that you should have an issue going after either one of them. Because I think that for this team to really hit their ceiling is to run the ball so they have they have effective play action because Russ is great off of play action and then he can take more shots. So I think that even if they rotate, I don't think it's a bad play because, okay, they, they share the load. They're both wide receiver 20. They're both starting level running backs. I, I, I can't disagree. Running back is a hellscape. If you find value there, take advantage of it because it's just gross. But that was a great point to end on. So let's go ahead and end it there. Buy yourselves from Najee Harris. Why not? I'll get on board the train. I'm not going to move him in my ranks. Damn it. But I'll acquire You're supposed it to move him in your ranks. I Okay, if we're going to do this, let me pull up my ranks again here real quick. <laughs> and I'll make. I'll tell you why I can't. Guys, oh, I have ahead of Najee Harris as of right now, at least immediately in front of him, James Conner. Much prefer him. Brian Robinson. Somehow I prefer him. Javante, somehow. Eh, uh, that's where it starts to get iffy. Maybe I gotta move James Conner up. Maybe I am too low on James Conner at being the while being the James Conner guy all at the same time. But then it's like Joe Mixon, Aaron Jones, Pacheco, Spears, Pollard, Henry, Swift, Cook, Walk. Like I there is the, there is talent at the running back position, even though we're calling it a hellscape, a lot of it is situational. I'm in at that price of where I have him at, at running back 25. I'm in at the price of like running back 18 even. I just can't move him higher. Fair. So that's no issue with that. But I'll still acquire him. But that has been another episode of the Dynasty Digest. Thank you guys for tuning in. You can follow me on Twitter at Perry underscore FF. That's Perry with an A. I feel like I, I I just am now realizing I should point that out because so many people spell Perry with an E, and even though it's been happening to me my entire life. It just occurred to me right now as I said it. Maybe I should point that out. P-A-R-R-Y underscore F-F. You can find Tim on Twitter at nubs with two N's and two B's. You can find all things JWB at JWB underscore F-F. Make sure you guys check out the description down below where you will find links to our Discord, our Patreon, our Clips catalog, Take advantage of the assets that we are putting out there for the world, guys. Even if you don't necessarily love what we have to say all the time, guess what? The Discord's got like 800 people in there talking ball. You can get so many different opinions. You can see what you know the market outside of what Keep Trade Cut says, outside of what your leagues may say. You can see some other markets and get some great information out of that. Make sure you hit the subscribe button if you like the content so you don't miss anything. Like the video if you liked the video, and we will see you all in next week's episode. Cut the show off. We're done.